Um, let me uh, <clears throat> welcome everyone tonight. And uh, as usual, I'm going to <clears throat> go through the slides relatively quickly. Um, certainly ask questions if you have questions, either during, yeah, I'm happy to have you interrupt or, um, yeah, or at the end. And then uh, once we cover the topic for tonight, uh, we'll talk VIR itself with a turn-by-turn -turn, uh, description of, of the track. So tonight's topic is car balance, uh, avoiding understeer and oversteer. Um, and whoops, before we dive into that, um, I, I do want to just take a very quick poll and ask everybody that's uh, on the call to just um, click the run group that you're in at VIR so, so that I have uh, some idea of uh, the level of experience that, uh, of, of the drivers on, on the call. Um, you know, since tonight's topic is advertised as an advanced topic, uh, that doesn't mean if you're a student driver, you, you won't learn something but uh, some of this is definitely uh, for more advanced drivers. Okay, so um, majority of people in uh, the, red, the white and black and red run groups, but uh, we do have, uh, it looks like here, I'll share them. Whoops, uh, I'll share the results so you can see them. Um, you should be able to see the results, but you know, we have uh, five of you in the student run groups and then, uh, 17, if I'm counting right, uh, people in, in other run groups. So um, thank you for that. So with that, we're gonna dive in. Um, <clears throat> so um, what, what I'm gonna do tonight is, is kind of start with a big picture uh, about handling and then focus on how as a driver, we can address understeer and oversteer and then we'll move into car adjustments, if you will, uh, that uh, 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 that affect how the car handles. And uh, as always, there's lots of adjustments. Uh, <clears throat> there's lots of opinions on car setup. And I, my biggest piece of advice would be to know and trust what your sources are. And in particular, you want to understand why if you're trying to make a change or the car isn't handling properly. There, there's one very nice new resource that's just out from Ross Bentley called How to Tune Your Car's Handling. Uh, it's a free download. You can just search for it, you know, give him your email and you can download it. So I can't send it to you, um, but he's happy to have you download it. What I have done is, is uh, used a lot of his material with credit here uh, for some of the discussion tonight. And then if you want more, I took a picture of some of the books I own that talk about handling. Um, and there's no end of books out there and sources. So uh, so if, if you're really into this topic, lots to learn. But let's, you know, kind of uh, start with what Ross calls principles. And <clears throat> um, he stresses that balance is actually more important than overall grip. In other words, how the car feels when you turn the car in and does it give you confidence in the corner and so on is, is really important. And just as important, don't approach handling with any preconceived ideas. If you heard somebody say, well, you know, I run 28 pounds tire pressure or I run this sway bar or this set of springs, well, that may be good or it may not, but whether it's good or bad, it may not affect you. Um, and the other important issue is all cars have handling issues. Um, it, you know, especially if you put a pro in them, they can tell you things that you and I would never in a thousand years find. But if you're driving and you can't feel the handling issue of the car, in other words, uh, it, the handling isn't affecting you, then focus on the driving uh, because the car is doing fine. And secondly, you can't judge a handling issue, whether it's understeer or oversteer or, or anything else, 
unless you as the driver are very consistent. You've heard pros talking talk about being a test driver uh, in order to work on car setup because if you're inconsistent as a driver, well, you know, the car's not, not gonna behave the same way all the time. But if you're good enough to feel the, what the car is doing and feel like it needs to be adjusted in some way, then we want to start with a diagnosis. And um, Ross calls that a handling debrief. A quick version of that would be, you know, I just came in from a session. Was it handling better or worse? Uh, I just made a change. Was it better or worse? And if I could have the car do just one thing better next time, what would that be? You know, would it be you know uh, less understeer, whatever that might be, more grip. Um, there's a long version if you want to get serious uh, that that uh, he calls a detailed debrief, and that's taking the track map and going to each corner where you're concerned about the handling and writing down what's happening. Uh, maybe the car is understeering at turn in to turn one, but then is oversteering as you get out to the exit. Um, write that on the map. And write down as many other details as, uh, as you can, basically. So <clears throat> if we're going to do that, how do, we, how do we feel what the car is doing? How do we know if it's understeering or oversteering? Or maybe it's doing both at different times in the same corner. Well, this is where experience comes in. But um, most of you have enough experience to have some sense of this. But you can improve your ability with sensory input sessions. Most of you have heard me talk about these in the past, where you, know, you, you go out for a half a session or a session and just focus on your seat of the pants what's the car feeling like and then a different part of the session focus just on the feel and the steering wheel Fo or vision you know what attitude or direction angle does the car have these are ways to get you more sensitive to what the car itself is doing again assuming you're driving in a consistent fashion and of course the in the newer cars if you're PSM or other electronic uh, uh, aids are activating, then something's definitely going on. Um, and if you have PSM on your car, I hope you know where the PSM light is on the dash. And I hope you are aware of when it actually activates. Uh, if you're not, and I've ridden with, as have many other instructors, ridden with drivers with quite a bit of experience, who have that light on a lot and are totally unaware of it. And so you really need to know where that light is and pay attention to it because it could well be, you know, saving your bacon. And if it is, then um, that gives you uh, a lot of input and a place to, uh, and a place to start. So <clears throat> the biggest cause of understeer and oversteer the driver, right? Um, I mean, that, that's true at all levels of driving. And, uh, and so that's where we're going to start. So <clears throat> understeer, I've been using that term. Most of you probably know what it means. It's, it's pretty straightforward. The car won't turn. Um, the white Porsche and the picture at top right on a skid pad, you look at the front tires, you know, the, the, the front tires are turned in a sharp turn, the car is nowhere near going to turn at that angle. Uh, so uh, the, the front tires are basically, uh, you yeah, know, feels like they're, they're sliding. They're actually not, but it feels like they're sliding sideways. So what can a driver do to cause understeer? Well, the answer is a lot of things, but the most common one is entering a corner too fast. Um, you get into a particularly a slow corner, too fast, turn the wheels, and they can't turn on that sharp of an angle, just like the white Porsche on the previous slide. Now, this is easy to see at an autocross. If you've ever been to an autocross, 
and watched an inexperienced driver or even some drivers with some experience attack a slow corner, you know, they'll come in really fast and stand on the brakes and turn the wheel and not much will happen. Uh, they'll tend to plow straight ahead. Um, the same thing happens on the track. If we get into a slower corner um, too fast and turn the wheel, the, 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 the steering, uh, the car is gonna understeer. Same thing can happen if the steering input is too quick or too much. Um, you know, the, you know the, so the, the, the way you use the steering wheel can affect it as well. Now, obviously understeer, well, let me, let me say obviously, it can also be caused by abruptly coming off the brakes. So perhaps you've braked into turn one at VIR, you know, pretty heavily, you've trailed in with quite a bit of trail brake and you just abruptly lift your foot off. Well, the car might've been turning because there was enough weight on the nose, but if you lift that weight off uh, 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 all at once, then the car is gonna understeer. Um, the same thing can happen on turn on, at an exit of a corner, uh, but this is, this, th these other issues happen in the early part of a corner uh, versus the last one here. If you get in, if you decide to accelerate out of a long, slow corner, like turn one again, um, and you get on too much gas and you have not had time to unwind the steering wheel, again, the car is going to understeer. So those are all things that, you know, can and do happen uh, at a DE event all the time. Um, you know, caused by the driver. Um, and, you know, this last one is just a variation on the too aggressive throttle. If you, this, if you're one of the students on the call, this is a common uh, student mistake of not, we call it unwinding the steering wheel as we exit a corner. If we keep the steering wheel uh, turned, but we get on the gas, sooner or later, the front tires are going to complain. That complaint is understeer. So how do we fix understeer? Well, uh, if it's early in the corner, uh, we probably need to come in slower. We might be able, well, we can brake earlier or harder so that we come in slower. If, if we're not overcooking it too much, we can perhaps come in with more trail brake uh, or a longer trail brake. Um, and, and again, that's if you're in the right range of the speed of the corner. If you're simply coming in too fast, that's not going to be enough. Uh, in some cases, a smoother and more progressive turn in will help uh, so that we don't, so that we're nicer to the front tires as we're turning into the corner. Um, if you have mid corner understeer, and this is much less common, but it can happen, uh, then a very slightly, and I mean a few inches or a foot, slightly later turn in might help, uh, but more likely we just need to wait a little bit to get on the gas. Um, because patience at the end of the day, if you're dealing with understeer, is a virtue. Now, those are preventions we can do, but if we're in the middle of the corner and we have to compensate, um, we're really gonna need to straighten the steering wheel when our instincts are to turn the wheel more. So th this is not, in not what your instincts are going to tell you to do. You may be able to slow down or lift very carefully you know, or maybe brake, again, depending on where, if you're in the early part of the corner and so on. But those are <clears throat> much better to prevent than, uh, than to have to compensate. Now, the reverse is oversteer or loose. And this is basically the car feels like it wants to spin. Um, and you know, the, the nose of the car is pointed uh, in, you know, to the inside of the, inside of the corner. Um, now, here's one of my favorite ways to think about understeer and oversteer that Randy Popes, um, you know, mentioned in one of our, in one of the times we had him speaking. He said, understeer is slow, but oversteer is scary. And I agree with him on that because if the car 
is, is oversteering very much, it's nervous. And you're gonna, as a driver, feel nervous. And so he, he much prefers a car that understeers a little bit, you know, because at least he knows what to do with it. Uh, and, and he talked a lot about being patient and had some stories about being patient with a race car that was uh, understeering. So a, a driver can cause oversteer. Um, uh, the most common way is to enter a corner with too much brake. And so again, a slow corner like turn one, if you come in there on heavy trail brake, um, the back end of the car is going to be light and it's going to want to come around. Uh, so that's, that's an easy thing to have happen. Um, fortunately, modern Porsches are really good and they, they can handle a lot of trail brake. But this is an example where PSM you know, may well intervene and you don't know it. Uh, you, you came in with too much brake. Uh, too much trail brake, but the uh, uh, the PSM is keeping you keeping the back end from stepping out, and you may not be aware of it unless you're paying attention to the dash. Now, there's always the famous trailing throttle oversteer. You know, uh, if if you get into the corner somewhere somewhere and you're already on some gas and then you lift, um, you know that that uh, that could happen. Um, there's some other causes here. These are all uh, less common. The last one is the spectacular stuff you see on TV. And if you have a powerful car, you can you know, slide the back end out as you're exiting a corner like the red car at the bottom is, is doing. Um, that is very uh, impressive to watch, but it's slow um, and also kind of hard on rear tires. So how do we fix oversteer? Uh, probably less trail braking um, or off off the brake sooner. Uh, certainly, in some cases, it's a smoother transition off the brakes. Uh, more progressive steering input can help here too, and you know it may mean less or later gas uh, use of the gas pedal being smooth. Compensating for oversteer requires practice and counter steering. And we've talked about the CPR in the past, you know, a, a, a very minor, you know, wiggle of oversteer, you know, can be, you know, caught by an experienced driver. If you get a serious amount of oversteer, now we're talking about, you know, trying to avoid a serious spin, which means we need a major correction immediately now, then the pause to let the car settle, and then to recover uh, uh, and get the car under control. Uh, the, you know, we're now in sort of emergency situations and uh, we, we're trying to just keep the car on the track and all the time we're looking ahead to where we wanna go. So that's the driver. Uh, so let's talk about you know, what we can do with adjustments on the car itself. Uh, if, we, if we think we're not causing the problem, but we need to uh, do some, some things. Well, here's the graphic version of Ross's handling debrief. So again, we need to do some diagnosis to know what problem are we trying to solve? Is it an understeer problem or an oversteer problem? But assuming we know that, then <clears throat> you know, we, we wanna ask ourselves, you know, do we, what is it we want? Do we want the understeer solved, the oversteer solved? Maybe just we just want the car to turn in better into the corner, being more responsive. Or maybe we'd like more total grip. Maybe the car just doesn't feel hooked up uh, uh, as well as we'd like. Well, uh, Ross points out that there's a trade-off between the overall level of grip, balance of the car, and the responsiveness of the car. And you know, you're gonna, if, if you go too far with one, you may well mess up the other one. And then you have to think about, are we thinking about slow corners, fast corners, you know, under turn in, you know, all these things affect, you know, what you may wanna do with the car and we're not gonna solve that tonight. But what I can suggest is, you know, here's, you know, the, if you will, the basics of how to make adjustments one at a time, 
uh, big enough that you're sure to, sure to feel what they are. Um, you know, sometimes people will change tire pressures by one pound. Well, I'm here to tell you, your seat of the pants a lot better than mine if you can feel a difference in one pound of tire pressure. Um, make notes of what you're doing. Uh, and if you, if you try some things and, and the car is worse, write that down because that's important to know as well. And there's some, there's some suggestions on the right here you know, to work with what you have. If the only adjustment you have while you're at the track is tire pressures, then you know, work with tire pressures. Um, but you know, if you're if you're making changes, ABA tests are a, 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 a what you really want to do. You know, maybe you're going to change the front sway bar. You know, you're going to tighten it up one notch uh, after a baseline run. Well, tighten it up. That's your B test. Tighten it up. See what it's like, and then put it back and drive the car again and see if you still think you know, the change was what you thought it was the first time. Um, not going to spend much time here, except um, to to uh, point out that sometimes drivers think, okay, I just need to bolt on a stiff sway bar or two stiff sway bars, and uh, and some stiff springs, and everything will be uh, everything will be better. Well, that's not really right because when you do that, you generate more weight transfer which is, means less grip. So the graph that's here shows you what, ha what happens, you know, as you move weight from the inside to the outside, you know, the, the traction loss on the inside is greater than the traction gain on the outside. So, uh, so stiffer is not necessarily better is the short answer on that. What is critical, and this determines you know, how the car feels, is front versus rear roll stiffness. And the general rule is, you know, to soften the end of the car that needs more grip. So uh, if, if the car needs more grip in the front, we soften the, the shocks or the springs or the, or, the, uh, or the sway bar in the front. But there's a common exception to that, which I've run into with my own car. And I know other people have as well. And that is that, <clears throat> especially as it pertains to springs, um, if too much roll, you know, of the body uh, can, uh, can cause less grip. And so the springs need to get to a certain point or a certain stiffness, you know, before these rules apply. And if this sounds like I'm hedging, well, um, you're going to hear a lot of that because there's very few black and white rules here. So that, with that said, let's talk about how one would reduce understeer. Um, you could look at tire pressures. Uh, maybe you add four pounds in the front. Um, we're going to talk more about tire pressures in a minute. But in traditionally, that's what I would have recommended to a driver, you know, who said the car was understeering. I would add some some pressure in the front and uh, and see what happens. Uh, certainly, if you soften the front sway bar or stiffen the rear sway bar, you will reduce the understeer in the car. Uh, that, that's one of the few things here I can pretty much, uh, not 100%, but 90% guarantee. Same for larger front tires. You know, 944s, you know, Porsche originally sent out of the factory with square setups. Then later, they sent them out with smaller front tires than rear. Those cars all understeer, and if you balance that out with the right tire on the front, all of a sudden the car feel handles like it was supposed to. Uh, it, you know, if you have splitters or wings, that can affect uh, understeer. Springs, uh, again, if you are dealing with a proper race car or a, a Porsche that's really set up well, if the car is understeering, then you would soften the front springs. Um, and, but my experience has shown that's not always the case. Shocks deserve their own uh, topic. And, uh, but in theory, reducing, if you have adjustable shocks, you can make some adjustments. Now, I do want to point out that understeer is not always bad. If you're in a fast corner, 
Um, understeer is your friend, uh, as in this photo. And, and so if you're in turn um, 10 at, at the VIR, a little bit of understeer is pretty good. It's a fast corner. You know, we don't want the back end going anywhere. We want it planted uh, on the track. So, you know, a little bit of understeer may not be a bad thing. The setup changes to reduce oversteer are just the mirror image of what we went through, um, you know, uh, with sway bars and, and so on. Um, and I can, I can tell you that the, uh, that the, the downforce issue is a big deal. We had a driver at uh, Lightning a couple of years ago who had, I think he lost, oh, he lost the rear wing. Something had happened with the rear wing. And um, uh, the adjustment that finally made the car drivable was actually to take the splitter off the front. Um, and because I think he made uh, sway bar adjustments and even that wasn't enough. So, you know, the arrow, if you have arrow help, um, that's sort of a, its own world, which I am no expert on, but I'm just, I mentioned that just to point out how big an impact that can actually make. So tire pressures deserve their own uh, uh, attention here for just a minute. Um, do you add pressure or decrease pressure for more grip? Well, yeah, who knows? Um, it depends on where you are. Every tire has a traction or grip uh, curve like the red line that you see on the chart here. Um, and every tire has a sweet spot uh, for where it wants to be for pressure. Now, if it's a really highly tuned racing slick, that sweet spot might be plus or minus half a pound uh, to, to really optimize it. But with street tires, you know, that's a, there's a fairly wide range. It's plus or minus several pounds, you know, where, where the grip is gonna be pretty, uh, pretty consistent. If you have an R compound tire like a Hoosier, uh, or a triple eight, uh, maybe not quite as uh, um, forgiving as a street tire, but still they work pretty well over, you know, plus or minus a few pounds. So it really depends on where you are at the moment. Um, if, if you've got a modern 911 that where the factory says, you know, the, the rear tire pressure should be 48 pounds cold, when you go out on the track and drive hard, it's probably, the rear tires are probably gonna have too much pressure. Um, uh, conversely, if you have a car a few years older, uh, where the settings tended to, in the front especially, tended to be uh, um, uh, soft for uh, ride and or understeer reasons, uh, you almost surely would want to increase versus factory settings, for example. But all that said, if you're not sure, here's how to figure it out. Uh, whatever baseline pressure you've started with, you know, do a run with that pressure and make your notes and see what you think. Then add four pounds, either all the way around or one end or the other, depending on what you're trying to do. And do a second run because uh, four pounds should be enough in any tire or any car to feel a difference and see if that's better or worse. And then come in and do a third run, you know, at four pounds under your original baseline. And you'll know after doing that, you know, which, you know, which way you need to go with the tire pressures, and then you can refine it from there. But um, the, it seems like a black art, and, and it may be for some people, but there is a way to solve it, uh, which is suggested here. The objective, obviously, we want the car to be balanced and neutral so that the car kind of feels like it's on rails. When it's set up that way, we can steer the car with our fingertips on the steering wheel and we can steer with the throttle. Uh, you know, as we get on the gas, you know, a little bit too much, the car will understeer. If we uh, come off the gas a little bit, uh, the car, the car will tuck its nose in, and you know th there aren't too many corners on the track where we, yeah, you know, we can practice that. Uh, but uh, but this is what we all strive to have the car feel like when we're on the track. 
Quick question, Bill. Yeah. Um, temperature difference. Like I see what VIR is going to look like and it's going to be cold. Is that normally indicate I'd want more or less pressure? Uh, cold, Frank, always indicates more pressure. Okay. Um, now, how much more yeah. um, varies, but in my experience, um, you know, 40 degree temperatures like are common in the morning at VIR. Uh, and we had some very cold temperatures at Watkins Glen, uh, you know, in September as well. Um, first thing in the, in the morning. Um, so I usually start my, my Hoosiers about two pounds higher than I normally would when, when it's that cold. Um, and it, it, as the day warms up, I almost inevitably end up bleeding some or all of that off, depending on how warm the day gets. Uh, because if the sun's out and, the, and, and uh, even if the air temperature is only the 50s, but the sun's out, the track's warm, the tires get warm. And, uh, and, and so, you know, you, you'll be close to normal. Uh, but for sure, uh, and, yeah, at the beginning of a cold day, um, you know, a little more pressure is your friend. Right. The other thing I would point out, the mistake a lot of people make, they say, well, the car really doesn't handle or feel right in the cold temperatures. Well, in most cases, they're not giving the tires enough time to warm up. Most people think, oh, I did one lap around, so now everything's warm, I can go. Everything should be, you know, it should be ready to go. Well, on a cold morning, that is not going to be the case. You know, even at a track like VIR, even a long track like VIR, it, my view, it, yeah, my experience rather is that tires, and now I'm talking about our compound tires, take two, sometimes even three laps, you know, to get, uh, to get warm. Now that's the bad news. The good news is that by the time you get them warmed up, they're pretty good. <laughs> the, the, the car feels fine unless, um, unless it's really, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, if, if it's an overcast day, then not quite as much because the track won't get as warm, but even then the track will warm up. So, um, uh, yeah, Ernie, thanks for the uh, forecast, um, highs in the mid fifties and lows 33 to 38. So yeah, it'll be, it'll be nippy in the morning, uh, for sure. Okay, so <clears throat> here's an interesting old picture uh, that just says, you know, every driver likes different car setups. The one in front is, is, a, is, is a neutral uh, car. The one behind is oversteering. The one behind that is understeering. And this is a function kind of how those three different drivers wanted cars set up as well as where they are in, in, in the corner. But uh, uh, just pointing out that, you know, there's, there's no right answer here. For those of you that want to learn more, uh, the Ross Bentley thing has a bunch more things, which, which some of which is here. There's all those books out there. <clears throat> if there's any of you who are race car engineers, then you can, <clears throat> you're welcome to uh, dive into the book that you see on the right here. Uh, for the rest of us, we'll, uh, we'll do something else. <clears throat> so to summarize, um, you know, Handling is all about starting with what the car is doing and knowing what the car is doing. And learning that is a key part of uh, advanced driving on the track. Uh, in, in most modern cars, handling issues are caused by the driver, not the car. Um, that said, there's a lot of factors that affect handling if you wanna get into that. And we have to remember that you know where we are on the track, matters. The same car, same driver can understeer in part of a corner and oversteer in part of the same corner. And, uh, and that's perfectly normal. And some drivers like that, some drivers don't like that. But, um, but that the, if the car is reasonably well set up, <clears throat> that's not that uncommon. Okay, questions um, that uh, uh, other folks have. Let me uh, do this here. <clears throat> so questions, comments before we uh, move on to uh, 
talk specifically about VIR. <clears throat> Makes perfect sense, right? I actually hope I gave you some things to think about because handling, car handling is, uh, is a bit of a, it's not a black art because the engineers know how to do it. But for those of us who don't do it for a living, you know, trying to figure out what we should do with our cars, um, you know, we, we, need, we need to uh, uh, need some guidance usually. Okay. Other questions, comments? I'm, I'm going to VIR with a, uh, a little bit of nervousness. I had a, a off-track incident at Lightning where um, I'm pretty sure I had too much steering in and I got back to the throttle too soon um was a little bit too aggressive and what surprised me is that i really didn't feel the oversteer until you know it was too late basically and i ended up countering and basically driving off because i knew i had traffic close behind me so okay. um i i need to temper my aggressiveness at vir particularly in 10, because I know that's uh, fast. And yep. uh, I've oversteered there with an instructor and I thought for sure we were going to wreck and we were in a 911 and he stayed in it uh, very bravely, braver than I think I probably would have been. Um, but uh, it's, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm driving in the white group, which is the most, you know, intermediate level, and, uh, you know, driving faster, but, you know, not really having the experience to uh, know what to do all the time. Yeah. So. Yep. Well, being able to sense oversteer in particular, um, you know, is, is a learned thing and is very hard to learn on the track. Um, and that's where autocross and skid pads and car control clinics are really huge. Um, and, you know, because there you, you can uh, get the car loose, feel it, correct it, you know, let it, or have it spin and no harm, no foul. But, you know, there's no track we run on where, you know, we really want to, you know, you, know, you know, spin the car where it's perfectly safe to do that. Um, and uh, so I'm glad you're able to drive it off, but, uh, uh, but you put your finger on the key factor, which is being able to sense, you know, that oversteer as early as possible. Because if we sense it very early, then a very minor correction and, and we're good. Uh, but it, as it starts to go, as you, uh, as you experienced, you know, we don't, our, we run out of options real fast. Uh, yeah. And we, and fortunately, I don't think, well, I hope no one on this call has a uh, car that's set up to oversteer a lot. Uh, in a perfect world, the car might oversteer a little bit in a slow corner and understeer a little bit in a fast corner. And some people do try to set cars up that way. Um, but uh, um, the, the good news is modern Porsches and other modern cars that are on track are pretty, uh, the handling's pretty good and they're pretty well set up unless, uh, unless you start to, uh, yeah, push them too far off of what they're designed to do. Other comments? Okay. The, uh, we're gonna, gonna share this. <clears throat> this is where I can uh, need to see where my... Yep. Give me one second here. Okay. Okay. All right. So I had to set up a couple things. So we're going to talk uh, VIR uh, and uh, do a drive around the track. As always, there's a disclaimer here that uh, uh, if you try something that's suggested and it doesn't work, uh, it's your fault, not mine. Okay. Um, so 
Um, so with that caveat out of the way, um, <clears throat> VIR, um, everybody should know the track. Hopefully uh, people know the passing zones. Let me just quickly mention the passing zones uh, for reference. Now in red and black, we have expanded passing, but it really doesn't change the passing zones very much. Obviously the back straight is a nice long passing zone. So is the front straight. In, in red and black, we can pass in a little shoot at the top of the hill here, uh, not in the student groups. Um, <clears throat> and there's a passing zone between one and two, between three and four, uh, after the snake, and then downhill after 10. Now I wanna emphasize, <clears throat> and this is in the track pack, but we always have more than one driver who somehow misses this. On the back straight, passing is on the left side only. Uh, that means if there's a car right behind you, an oak tree, as soon as you track out, you need to come to the right side of the track and then give the pass signal on the left. Do not give a pass signal on the right coming out of oak tree. In a similar fashion on the front straight, passing is only on the right. And it's easy enough to come down the hill on 17 and, and, and you kind of headed to the right side of the track and to give a pass on the left, wrong. Give the, you know, stay left, give the pass on the right. And if, if you're both arriving at the kink, then the car giving the pass needs to stay off the kink to allow room you know, for that car to go by. The shoot here after the snake is left side only. Uh, after South Bend is, uh, uh, you can pass on either side. Um, three and four is a left side pass as is uh, the 15 to 16 section. So um, if you're not, if that didn't all seem like second nature to you, study the track pack because uh, there's a different map, but the passing zones are there and, and, and described. Um, now I'm going to do a turn by turn around the track, but there's a written document on the website. And those of you that uh, want a refresher on VIR or that uh, haven't been there before or whatever, uh, you know, this document's your friend. It has all the diagrams in it that uh, I'm going to use tonight. Um, the uh, in-car pictures that I'm going to use are from the video that's on the same page on the website. So, uh, so everything that I have here tonight is, uh, is also on the website. And I strongly encourage people to uh, study this uh, document. So <clears throat> just to get everybody warmed up, uh, I'm gonna play a quick video here um, that, uh, hold on, why did that not start? Something, uh, give me one second, something's not right here. Uh, why? Okay. Uh, why that? Okay, let's try this again. Okay. Well, for some reason it's not playing it properly. But anyway, staging's checking. Pit out is uh, is holding me up because there's a car uh, coming uh, you know off off track. What I want to remind people of is the blend line. Blend line is right side of the track all the way to the apex of turn one, and you all know why because look how fast cars are coming by us on the left here. I don't care how fast you accelerate coming out of the pits. Uh, you can't get out of out of the way of those cars. So a, all the way to the apex here. And then as we go between one and two, I just want to remind everyone that there is a passing zone here and everyone should use it. So it's easy to send one or two cars by uh, between one and two. Uh, it's also easy to send one car by between three and four, you know, where we are now. So um, just a, a, a way to get us, yeah, you know, in the mood, if you will, for VIR. So turn one, um, as you can see from the overhead, it's 180 degree plus corner. Um, you can also see, if you look, 
that it's an increasing radius corner. In other words, it opens up in the second half. Um, and that means we can accelerate out and do want to accelerate out. But the only way we can do that is to, uh, is to slow down enough to get through the first part of the corner. And there are a lot of things that, that make turn one a challenge. First of all, it's fairly sharp. <clears throat> it's, um, but also it's quite flat. Um, there's only a little bit of helpful camber here and there, but it's more or less flat. There's not a lot of excess room or asphalt here to deal with. So, so um, but we really can't get on the gas until we get past the apex here. So we can trail break, uh, you know, all the way to the apex if you want. Um, so we can trail break a lot in this corner, um, recognizing that the braking zone is uh, you know is is you know has you know doesn't have a lot of grip is what I'm trying to say, and the other thing I want to point out notice the apex is a is a range or a distance along the curb it's not a point where we clip it's actually ten or twenty feet of the curb and you're going to see that a lot here at VIR a lot of long apexes where we don't just clip the curb we actually run along the curb for some some distance. So here we are approaching the braking zone for turn one. Um, it's a little hard to see, but there is a rise in the track around the two marker. Um, and that can help us as, as we're braking. But this is a slow in fast out corner. And therefore we do not wanna try any heroic late braking on this corner. Uh, if I guarantee, it, that sooner or later doing that will, will take you off track into the grass uh, on the outside um, because the braking zone here can be slippery. Even if it's not slippery, it's not very grippy. And, uh, and it is downhill until you get that little bit of a rise. When you get over that little rise, as I said before, it's flat. So, um, so this is a place to, to uh, you know, practice your brake modulation and not try to brake at the last possible moment. Uh, turn in is down right before the arrow. <clears throat> and as I said before, the apex is, is well, it's kind of the second half of the curb here. Um, and we're gonna run, run along that. And then we're gonna begin to feed power on. And we wanna end up mid track uh, plus or minus here. Um, you know, some of us run a little bit wider, some people, uh, you know, not quite as wide, but I uh, certainly want to be, uh, don't want to be on the right side of the track. You want to be accelerating and letting your momentum, you know, take you out to at least mid, mid track here. Now, turn two is basically just an arc. Uh, it really isn't driven as a corner. Now, I'll, let me orient you on the diagram. Uh, the track is going from top to bottom here. So uh, at the top of the, of the uh, slide here is, is it, we're coming from turn, uh, uh, turn one and we're headed down you know, the slide to, uh, you know, toward the track out. But we're looking, yeah, as we uh, approach turn two, we're really looking for this green and yellow curbing that you see um, at the bottom here, that's the uh, turn in reference for turn three. We're trying to get ourselves over there. One way we can make that uh, give ourselves an early reference is notice these trees as we come out of turn one. Um, you know, the tech barn, and it's hard to see here, um, is just coming into view. Um, but that is just when you see that tech barn, now we know it's time to kind of bend the car and aim for that tech barn and that'll take us where we want to go. Um, you know, here's the apex for two. Uh, some people run a, a wider line, uh, not apexing all the way in here. That's okay. Uh, it makes the setup for three a little bit easier for some people. Um, I don't think it's faster. But, um, but if it's more comfortable for you and your car, there's nothing wrong with it. Here's turn three. Um, you know, notice the uh, green and yellow curbing out there. That's uh, our reference to turn in at the end of that. 
uh, again, a long apex. Um, this corner, we're gonna trail break some into and then start to get on progressive gas to accelerate. This is a reasonably fast corner. Um, here you see that, that uh, curbing and we wanna be out you know, very close to that curbing. We don't wanna be on it. Um, don't have to use the, every last inch, but I see a lot of cars, a car width or more in from here. That's absolutely wrong. We wanna, we wanna be out here to open up this corner. So turn in is right at the end of that green and yellow for most, for most people. Um, second half of the uh, curbing for the apex, and then we can exit. Uh, headed down to turn four. Um, turn four, um, arguably the slowest corner on the track um, and, uh, and one that's a compromise because we have to sacrifice the exit to 4A to set up 4B. And so that's all this, uh, that's what all of these arrows are trying to show us here. Uh, so this is a heavy brake, slow down, uh, get the car turned in. We're aiming kind of for the end of that green and yellow uh, curb. And we want the car on the left half of the track here uh, as we exit 4A. We do not want to track out all the way. Um, you know, ideally we'd be all the way track left here. Some people feel that gives up a little too much, but we want to be, you know, within a car width of the left side of the track as we exit 4A and set up 4B. So here's braking, you know, for, for turn four. Here's the, uh, the apex uh, at the end of that green and yellow. And <clears throat> notice that the car is, is pretty much track left at this point, uh, you know, exiting 4A, setting up 4B, uh, and, you know, which is ahead. And 4B, you know, there's a kind of a wide, part of the curve that sticks out that's the apex here. But from this point, exiting 4A, we want to turn the wheel to the right in, the, in one arc, and that arc is going to take us all the way over to 2 and, and into the snake, into turn 5A. So this is one arc feeding gas on as we, uh, as we work our way uh, you know, out of 4B over to 5A and 5B, which is the beginning of the snake. Um, and really the key here is 5A. And <clears throat> we, we really want to get it set up uh, correctly. So we have that one arc. You see the continuation of it here in the red line. And, uh, uh, and that's going to allow us, if we get it right at 5A, to basically straighten out the snake. Um, so here we are. You know, a, you know, some distance yet from 5A, um, but we want to be pretty much track left, although we have to be a little careful. There is a bit of a groove in the pavement there that has a tendency to grab tires sometimes. So, so um, you know, one nice smooth arc. <clears throat> we want to be fixated on getting the car, you know, properly lined up at 5A so that when the car is at the apex of 5A, um, just past where the car is in this picture, that we're looking at the bridge. The bridge is hard to see here because it's dark, but uh, most of you have been to VIR, you know what I mean by looking at the bridge. If, you're, if the attitude of your car at the apex here is looking left of the bridge, you can't go to the gas yet. You can't commit to the gas pedal like you would like to. If you're pointed at the bridge at the apex of 5A, now we can you know, well and truly commit to gas and, and accelerate out of, out of the snake. Um, some people, uh, I generally don't recommend driving on the curbs at, at VIR. This is one where <clears throat> it, it, it's a possible exception because if we do put the car up on the curbing here, there's some favorable camber in tight next to the curb here. So some people like to run very tight here and use, use that camber. It also helps obviously straighten out the snake a little bit. Um, but the attitude of the car is the really important part here. Now, 
5B is the curb on the left here. Uh, <clears throat> 5A curb is friendly and can be helpful. This one is the opposite. It's big and ugly and unfriendly. So um, you do not want to plan to hit this curb. Um, and if you do hit it, hit it late, not early on, because bad incidents have happened by people generally not getting the car pointed around quite enough, getting on the gas, and then getting on this curb. And uh, notice the tire wall on the right. It's not very far away at all. Uh, so, so 5B curb deserves a lot of respect. Okay, climbing S's, <clears throat> something happened in my slide here, I'm not sure what, but uh, <clears throat> the entry to the climbing S's is, is really uh, what it's all about. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll go through that, but turn seven, I guess it is, the, the first left-hander here, is where we're gonna set up the whole rest of this, of this sequence. So, so as we, come down the chute after the snake. When we get to the end of this access road here, that uh, it's not access road, it's the entrance to the north course. <clears throat> we wanna bend the car very gently <clears throat> over toward turn seven. So this is our turn in point, um, but it's a very, it's just a slight bend of the steering wheel over, over to seven. Now notice, as we're approaching the eight, the uh, curbing at seven here, the white line up here is straight uh, for you know, a car length or a little more. <clears throat> That's where we wanna put the car. We want the car kind of right along this white line. Um, and if we do that, we're gonna find that about the time we get to the end of that white line, that the front tires are gonna are going to compress into the hill that starts here. And that's our turn in. So we're going to turn in basically at the end of this white line. And by doing so, we will be able to go over the hill at, I guess this is 8A, um, pretty much square. In other words, you know, we'll be square 90 degrees to the hill and the car will be nice and planted and you know, we can carry good speed up, up through here. So, but it's very easy to turn in, whoops, turn in way too soon here, and then the rhythm isn't nearly as good. So we want to do this, if you will, late turn in for uh, you know for 8A, compress the car into the hill, and uh, and then away we go. So the apexes are late on these curbs. Um, uh, the first two, um, and then a little bit sooner, but still the second half of the curb here on, on 8B, and turn nine at the top of the corner here, kind of the middle of the curb. Um, now it's possible to get through the climbing S's and turn nine in such a fashion that we end up uh, so far track left, we cannot get back to the right for turn 10. And so we want to avoid that. We have to find an apex here that gives us, gets us out maybe no more than mid track or so, so that we can uh, come back in for our approach to turn 10. So here's turn 10, uh, uh, you know, driving, yeah, again, oriented. We're coming from the left, going to the right. And uh, again, it's a long apex. In this case, like the first <clears throat> half of the curb um, or so, that's the apex. <clears throat> we want to break straight in a straight line for turn 10. Most drive, many drivers trail break way too much here. Uh, this is not a trail breaking corner. This is a fast corner. We want to, you know, get our slow, we want to get slowed down in a straight line so that as we turn the car <clears throat> and start to head into turn 10, uh, we can start to squeeze on the gas pedal. I'm not saying put your foot on the floor, but I'm saying plant the back end of the car with the gas pedal so that you can progressively squeeze the gas pedal as you get through the corner. The turn in reference is when you see the end of the, of the apex curve. Um, the apex itself is sort of the middle of, of, of this curbing. And most of you know that 
as you start to get the track out, the track falls away. Camber is adverse, which is scary as heck the first few times you go through here, but you obviously have to get used to that. Uh, <clears throat> and really important to know if you get into this corner and you're in trouble, just drive it off. Everybody can see all this grass out here. There's lots of, there's, I don't know, 50 acres of grass out there that you can go, you know, you can drive off into. But cars that try to keep the car on when they're too early or too fast in this corner and try to save it, they hit the tire wall this in front of these trees on the in the dip in front of us here and they destroy the car. So <clears throat> this corner is not to be trifled with. Uh, a lot of fun when you get it right, De deserves lots of respect. Now, <clears throat> let me just point out one thing. We're exiting turn 10 here. Notice it's a, pretty much a straight line right over to the beginning of turn 11. And so we really don't have to do much of anything here except go straight down the hill and it'll set us up for turn 11. <clears throat> Oak tree turns 11 and 12, signature corner, of course. 11 is much faster than 12. Um, you can see that if you look carefully at the diagram, you know, the overhead you know, of the track. <clears throat> you should also know that 11 is banked favorably and 12 is not. Uh, in fact, 12 is, you know, particularly unhelpful because it goes flat uh, on us, uh, you know, right where we'd like it to have more grip. So, so. This is really quite a challenging corner. Um, <clears throat> and it's basically a decreasing radius, 180 degree corner, if you want to think about it that way. Most of us drive it more, more like two corners than one. Um, <clears throat> we can, we're coming down the hill fast out of South Bend, but we, um, we have this nice hill here to help us slow down. So, you know, yes, we have to break, but not as much as you might think. Um, because 11 is still fairly fast. Turn in is the one marker. There is an arrow up here. I have no idea what that's for. Turn in for this corner is at one. That'll put us across <clears throat> the middle of the curbing, maybe a little bit past the middle of the curbing and 11. But what we're really focused on is the outside of the track. We want, we want the car, you know, track left here up against the curbing, not on it, but up against this curbing <clears throat> that's on the outside of the track. And we're going to be on the brakes, you know, getting to this point to slow down because the corner does tighten on us. And that's a good thing that we're on the brakes because we need to turn the car a lot here. And some trail brake is very helpful in most cars uh, to help us do that. So we're going to turn the car. And this is a, a slow corner, fast hands. In other words, we're going to crank the wheel once we, you know, get to the to the right point here <clears throat> and and we're not going to be in a hurry to get to the gas pedal because that for reasons i'll show you in a second so as we approach the apex yeah <clears throat> we we want the car um we want the car pointed at the flag station you can just see the flag station ahead of us here um if we're if we're looking left of that flag station we can't get on the gas yet. So we need the car to get around far enough that the, at that flag station or to the right of it, that we can then begin to squeeze on the gas pedal and accelerate and using the second half of the track out curb here, um, you know, for our reference point or for our track up. <clears throat> okay, uh, passing zone, we talked about that. <clears throat> um, this is, the roller coaster at the end of the back straight turns 13, 14, and 15, actually. Um, <clears throat> I'll orient you. We're coming from, from the right here going to the left. Um, and so we're coming up a hill again to help us slow down. And then we're followed almost immediately by a uh, right hand and a left hand, you know, 15 or 14 and 15. So uh, this is a case where 14 is um, uh, is is compromised uh, to help us set up uh, 15. So here's the braking area at the end of the back straight. You know, note this is a pretty substantial hill. Can really help us slow down um, as we get near the top of it. But before the top of it, 
we want to bend the car in a little bit so that we can end up, well, yeah, as we get up here near the turn in, we want to bend the car in. So <clears throat> we're on the left hand half of the track here. Um, you know, it's fine to be all the way track left. Don't necessarily have to be every inch over, but we do want to be on the left hand half of the track to set up the right hander here. And the apex here and the car isn't in quite the right spot in this picture. Um, the apex is really, you know, uh, around the corner a little bit, but we're basically gonna pick this curbing up a little bit past the green, beginning of the green and yellow. We're just gonna follow it um, pretty much to the end of the green and yellow curbing. And then we're gonna turn in, uh, turn left uh, for turn 15, and get on the gas and go because the hill here, uh, as we as we head down, compresses the car and we have lots of grip. So uh, this is this is a fun section. Um, you know the car really hooks up as we uh, compress into the into the bottom here at uh, at uh, fifteen. So right after that, after that little shoot, <clears throat> um, is sixteen A and B you know, followed by 17. And <clears throat> this, again, this outside curbing as we approach, it's critical. Um, and so we want to get the car <clears throat> out along the uh, curbing and we want to turn in somewhere near the end of that curbing or in the second half of it <clears throat> and then brake. So we're not going to be on the brakes until we bend the car in toward the apex of 16A. And then we're gonna break in a straight line. And there's a nice little rise here to help slow us down uh, right before this uh, <clears throat> curbing starts. So we're gonna break and we're gonna line up kind of the second half of this curb on the left. <clears throat> and as we go along that curb, about the time we get to, again to the end of the green and yellow, um, we're gonna, we're going to turn the car for 16B, which is down at the at, at the bottom of the hill here. So we're going to follow this curb on the left. Some people actually drive on it to try to straighten out the corner a little bit. Um, I'm sort of torn as to whether that really helps or not. But uh, uh, but regardless, we're using this curb as a reference to set us up uh, for the right hander. And then once we turn right here, we can begin to feed gas on. And this feels like the car's falling off the edge of the world. I understand that, but, uh, but we are, uh, but we can accelerate and should, and, you know, because this is the beginning of the front straight. And uh, uh, 16B, um, you know, kind of the middle of the curb, 17, which I don't have a slide of here, um, we can, uh, we can stay off of that curb. Most people find it better to stay off of that, that apex curb rather by, uh, um, by a half a car width or a little more. Um, and also I should note that the track out curbing for 17, again, I don't have a picture of it here, is not very friendly. So we, uh, we, we wanna avoid that, uh, that curbing if we can as we exit 17. But, um, yeah, there's, okay. Yeah, this is as we're entering the front street. Okay. All right, so just a couple of cautions that we've talked about. Turn one is slower than it looks. Um, so is Oak Tree, they're both uh, quite slow. It's easy to overdrive uh, turn four. Um, and we talked about this, but South Bend, you know, deserves, uh, you know, deserves a ton of, of respect uh, because it's so fast and so easy to make a mistake there. All right, questions, comments? Everybody's got it figured out? Is there still a hole at the front part of turn nine? No, I don't think so. Um, uh, I have not been there this year, so I can't tell you for sure, but when we were there last year, that had been fixed. Um, if, it's, if we're thinking of the same uh, hole that was in front of one of the curbs. Um, um, I mean, some people like to drive on the curbs and the climbing S's, and uh, I guess that kicks up dirt and stuff. But uh, um, 
um, but hopefully not. Uh, and if there is, we'll certainly uh, put a cone in it or do something to make it, uh, uh, you know, make it apparent. I can say from past experience that if you don't get 4A right, you're going to be not right till you come out of 5B. <laughs> well, actually, the one of the early, actually, the, the first person I learned the most from <clears throat> at uh, VIR when it opened um, said the way the way he described turn four. He said the straight that ends at Oak Tree starts in turn four. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, you're basically <clears throat> carrying speed all the way from four to 12. If you're in a low horsepower car, um, the um, uh, you may not, you may almost never lift after four until you get to Oak Tree. So um, uh how much curb to use in turn 12? Well, 12 is oak tree. As a general rule, none of the apex curb. Uh, it's not helpful uh, uh, there. It's much more important to get the car turned. And if anything, if you hit the apex curb, it's probably not gonna help. Uh, a lot of people use the track out curbing at 12 um, at oak tree. And you know that's, that's okay. My general philosophy on using curbs like that one is that I want to use them as margin so that my normal line would be right up against it. But if I get in a little faster than normal or I make a small mistake or whatever, and I end up on the curbing, now I have the margin. Now, I know that the track a few years ago put that green asphalt outside the curbing at 12 and it and it uh, after turn four or turn three rather. Um, and I know some of the race cars like to run on that, although I think it's not clear that that speeds them up. In any case, uh, you're off track with, uh, in our event, when you're over the, over the curbs, even though there's green asphalt there. So, so, um, so if you like to consistently use the, apex, the track out curb at 12, that's fine. Um, I just realize it's pretty rough, and uh, and, and sooner or later, you know, it's probably going to be uh, wear out some parts on the car. Um, other questions? Okay. Well, I will mention that uh, I will. If you have friends uh, who weren't able to make it tonight, um, I have been recording this, so I will put the recording up on uh, on uh, YouTube uh, probably uh, tomorrow morning. Um, and uh, uh, I will be a VIR, so if uh, if you have questions, you know when you when you're there, don't hesitate to ask me or any of the chief instructors or any other instructors. Um, you know we're we're all here to help uh, everybody have a good time. We all know it's a challenging track and, uh, um, and, and, but definitely worth the trip. And, uh, and I, for one, I'm definitely looking forward to it. So thanks again, everyone. Appreciate you joining us and we'll see you at VIR. Thanks a lot, Bill. Thank you very much, Bill. Really appreciate <clears throat> it. You bet.